morning, everybody. I'm Pastor Ken Vance, the senior pastor here at Vertical Church, and welcome. Thank you for being with us today. And to all of the people who are tuning in online, thank you for taking the time out of your day to be a part of what God's doing here at Vertical Church. Well, today is the last in the series we've been doing called Tough as Nails. And we learned that Jesus was tough as nails and intended that we as followers would be as well. Now, if you haven't been with us through the course of this series, today may seem a little bit out of context, so I encourage you, you can always watch any of the messages online free of charge at your own convenience that way. But today, as we kind of, I'm, I'm going to be landing the plane, and where does this all land with us? And I'll warn you today in advance, today is more inspirational than it is informational. So if you didn't do your hair this morning, I'm about to part it. In other words, so... <laughs> We're going to today look at it because I want to grant us a challenge. I want us to look at it. How does all of this impact our lives? So I want to start with a few questions. Number one is this. What are we living for? Now, before you answer too quickly on that end, what are we living for? Better career, nicer home, nicer house. All those things are nice, but really in the light of eternity, what does that mean? What are we living for? With all that's gone before us, with everything that Jesus accomplished and his followers accomplished, what are we living for? What does our faith have to do with the way we are currently living? The second question, what have we done with our faith? What do we believe in God for? What do we believe in God for? A better job, a better car, for a better thing? Are we believing to see cities transformed? Are we believing to see the God of the Bible reveal himself in this generation? Are we believing that the God, who with all him all things are possible, would see actual change in our world? Or we just resigned ourselves to hide? Have we resigned ourselves to live cowards behind closed doors because the times we face are difficult? No, that's why the heart of the series, my friends, because the Bible wrote specifically and so much so about the days in which we live, where we might be tempted to withdraw, but no, we can be tough as nails. No, our faith can make all the difference in the world, but the question is, what have we done with our faith? And the last question, we kind of set it up is, listen, what are we willing to allow God to do through our lives. Why do I say it that way? Because with God, there's always a cooperative reality. We ask the question, God, where are you? The question that God asks back is, where are you? What will you allow me to do through your life? To kind of set up today's message, let me tell you a story. I heard this years ago, and the gentleman I heard it through, he was telling a story that while he was in high school, he ran track. He was on a relay team, 440 relay. In a 440 relay, everybody runs a quarter mile, okay? And they pass the baton to the next one down the chain. You ever see that run? Well, in his particular team, they had never won anything. They had never even placed in any contest. But they were invited to this statewide invitational. So when they were going to this invitational, they weren't expected to place. They weren't expected to even show. And he said, we kind of were going through the motions, because nobody, they didn't expect our team to finish to the other ones that already probably received the reward for winning the race, you know? He said, and we got there, and we were kind of going through the motions. He said, and then we lined up to run. He said, and somebody forgot to tell the lead runner that he was slower than everybody else on the field. Somebody forgot to tell the lead runner that we weren't supposed to win this race. See, nobody got to him. Nobody told him that they was not supposed to be able to win. And so when the gun went off, he took off like a lightning bolt. And he began to run the race of his life. And he began to build up a lead against the fastest teams in the state, taking almost eight seconds off his best time ever. Now, the second man that was about to receive the baton is looking at the guy before him run the race of his life. 
And he's beginning to ask himself the question, what do I do now? If he ran the race of his life, how do, am I supposed to honor the efforts that he's made? How can I not give everything I have? And so when he received that baton, he took off. Without any abandon, he began to run like he was going to leave it all there, reserving nothing to do honor to the one who had gone before him. And he builds up an even bigger lead. And so now the third guy in the, in the, in the team He's dealing with the compounded pressure of the first guy running the race of his life and the second guy running the race of the life. And he asks the question, what am I going to do? So he hears that baton and he takes off without any abandon, like a bat out of hell. He's running the race of his life. And now the guy who was telling the story is the fourth runner in it. He said, you can't imagine. His heart was palpitating. His head is going crazy. And he asked, he says, they were slow. They got faster. I'm slow, I can get faster. How can I allow the efforts of my team not to demand of me my very best? And so he said, when that baton hit his hand, he ran with blind abandonment. He ran with everything he was worth. And when they run the race, there was total shock. There was silence. Because this team that came out of nowhere, that never won anything before, suddenly, we're the champions of this statewide inv invitational. And so why do I use that? Because listen, what I want you to understand is that there is a baton that's being passed to this generation. If you have a Bible this morning, I want you to turn to the book of Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 11. As you're turning there, let me kind of tell you, the writer of Hebrews, we don't know historically for sure who wrote the book of Hebrews, but the reason that Hebrews is written, let me tell you this. The very first people who began to follow Jesus were Jewish, okay? They believed that Jesus truly was the Messiah. They began to follow him. In fact, when Christianity began, they actually, most people thought it was just a sect of Judaism, okay? Because Jesus was, a, Jesus was Jewish, okay? And their early followers, majority of them, were Jewish. But now, these believers who had trusted their life to Christ were facing difficulty. They were facing persecution. They had it twofold bad because why? The Jewish community they were raised in abandoned them, forsook them. They pretended like they didn't even exist. To them, they were dead. So they lost many of them, their professions, because they grow up doing what their families had done, and now their families wanted nothing to do with them. They, have restart, they started to receive difficulty and persecution among their own people, and then you had the Roman and the pagan world that didn't want anything. So they came across hard and difficult times. And many began to ask, is it worth it? Is it worth it? Because why? The writer of Hebrews, his reason for writing it is because many of them were considering turning back, going away from what they had now vowed their lives to because of difficulty because of hardness, because of the circumstances that were around them. So the writer of Hebrews is inspiring this group of people saying that it is entirely worth it. And then in a mastery, he begins to write, as we hear Hebrews 11, he begins to remind them of all of the people they had heard about all their lives growing up, the heroes of faith, People who they had looked up to, that they had esteemed, that in their generation, their faith in God made the difference for their communities, their societies, for their nation and all. And so as he writes, he's inspiring them. And we get to Hebrews 11 and look at verse 32. Hebrews 11 and 32. He said, and what more shall I say? I do not have time to tell about Gideon and Barak and Samson and Japheth and about David and Samuel and the prophets, verse 33, who through faith conquered kingdoms, administered justice, and gained what was promised, who shut the mouths of lions, verse 34, who quenched the fury of the flames, escaped the edge of the sword, whose weakness was turned into strength, and who became powerful in battle and routed foreign armies, women, received back their dead, raised to life again. There were others who were tortured, refusing to be released so that they might gain an even better resurrection. Verse 36, some 
face jeers and floggings and even chains and imprisonment. Verse 37. And they were put to death by stoning. They were sawed in two and they were killed by the sword. They went about in sheepskins and goatskins, destitute, persecuted, and mistreated. Verse 38. And the world was not worthy of them. They wandered in deserts and in mountains and living in caves and in holes in the ground. Verse 39. These all were commended for their what? For their faith. Yet none of them received what had been promised. Now look at verse 40. Since God had planned something better for who? For us. What he's telling them is, listen, guys, you've heard this all your lives. And that generation was no different than us. You see, those first century believers, we have this idea where we tend to look back in history. We tend to look back on the characters that we see in our faith. When we start, we had this idea to think that somehow they are different. Somehow they were special. Somehow they were unique. Thank God for the Bible. I love the Bible because it's so absolutely transparent. It tells about the weaknesses and difficulties and challenges of those that went before. It doesn't hide. It doesn't omit their biggest challenges. It tells about Abraham. He's scared and allows the king to marry, to take his own wife into his harem because he's afraid he's going to get killed. But yet God calls him the father of faith. The Bible is so transparent because it inspires us when we read it with just regular eyes to recognize that they were just ordinary people like you and I. But what made the difference as we read here? It was their faith. It was their faith, which means it doesn't rely on you. It doesn't rely on your giftings, your abilities, your skills. You see, your faith is not in your resources. Your faith is not in your uh, education. Your faith is not in your skills and abilities. Is your faith founded in God? Because true biblical faith is the confidence that God is who he said he is, that God will do all that he's promised to do, all he's ever required is someone to trust him, someone to believe in him, someone to say, I believe that you are the God who made the heavens and the earth. Therefore, I will not allow the circumstances of my life to dictate what you can and cannot do. You are bigger than all that I face. And therefore, therefore, no matter what my generation brings, you're bigger. And this is what he's saying. Since God had planned something better for us, so listen, listen, so that only together with us would they be made perfect or complete. In other words, look at it in this regard. You ever wonder why the Bible doesn't say God has any grandkids? Because every generation must know the faithfulness of God for themselves. Because what God has been doing in the earth, it is like a massive relay race. That from generation to generation, the responsibility of passing off to the next is the realization of what God can do when someone will believe, when someone will trust, when someone will say, no matter what we face today, God, you're bigger. God, you're able. It doesn't matter what I bring to the table. God, you are able to do anything if I will believe. I'll trust. And that's what he's saying to them. Guys, do you realize that all of those that have gone before you, Abraham, Moses, all of them are waiting to see what will you do in this generation? Guys, today, let me tell you this. The apostle Paul, the apostle Peter, the generations, Justin Martyr, so many before that have gone on. Uh, uh, Martin Luther, John Wesley. You got, uh, guys, Charles Finney, you name it, Billy Graham, all of them are looking. Now, if you feel the weight of this, the baton is being passed to this generation. And how will we run the race with what's going on before us? If we see them in some way as unrealistic, that somehow that they were different, somehow they were special, somehow they had something that we don't have, we have missed the story all together. Because what made them different? What made them different? That's what they said. It was their faith. Look at verse 32. Look at what verse 30. He said, and what more shall I say? I don't have time to tell about Gideon. Why? If you ever struggled, Gideon was a coward. When when God showed up and said, mighty man of God, he's looking around going, who's he talking to? 
Why? Because where was Gideon when God first appeared to him? He was threshing wheat in a wine vat. Now, that don't mean anything to us. That's like practicing your golf swim in the bathtub, okay? It's, it's, it's pointless. But he was scared of the Midianites. But God took a coward and transformed him into a nation changer. He saved his generation. Why? Because of his valiance? No, because he learned to trust in Almighty God. Barak, Barak got the word, go to war. God's going to deliver the nation. And who told him that? Deborah. And in that generation, guys, it's not, the Bible's not chauvinist, but you have to understand, women didn't have a role. And he said to her, well, I'll go as long as you come with me. She said, if that happens, there's going to be a girl that's going to get credit for this act. Maybe you thought, man, maybe you ever watch a girl fight? Man, you always want one with you. But no, but listen, but Barak, listen, God used him, even though he wasn't willing to go without Deborah with him, okay? Samson, Samson, listen. Samson, did he struggle? He never conquered his battle with lust. But did it ever stop God from using him? Yeah, he lost his eyes. He ended up doing hard time in prison. Yeah, he got into difficulties and trouble. He brought shame and disgrace upon his family. But guess what? His willingness, even God, didn't forsake him. You are thinking, I don't got my business together. You're sitting there and you're going, man, if I do this, if I do that, if I get this together, that together, forget it. The only thing that'll change you is when you begin to trust in Almighty God. If God could use Samson, then... There is hope for you. And then he says, what, Japheth? You ever think you come from a family problem? Japheth's dad was named Gilead, a very, very prominent man in ancient Israel, okay? And he had sons, but guess who Japheth was the son of? A prostitute, okay? His dad didn't do the right thing by him, and his brothers and his family rejected him. They kicked him out. But when they got in trouble, he was a mighty warrior. And who did God tag and say, you're it? The one who would trust God. You think your family is dysfunctional? You think you've got situations to overcome? You're like, who am I? And what is my family? Let me tell you this. God isn't dependent on who your dad or who your mama is because God Almighty is a father. And when you trust in him, no matter where you come from, no matter what your lineage is, none of that is a reason why God can't use you. If you're taking notes with me this morning, listen. Faith overcomes inadequacy. I want you to look at verse 33 for a moment because why? Faith overcomes inadequacy. It says, who through faith? He gives this long lineage, but what was it that changed them? Was because they were something special? No, the Bible's clear about it. Who through faith? conquered kingdoms, administered justice, and gained what was promised, who shut the mouths of lions. In other words, it wasn't based on their resume. It was based on their confidence in Almighty God. Sometimes our natural skills and abilities, sometimes our resources can make us confident in the wrong thing. But God Almighty wants to know, who is it that will trust me despite whatever the circumstances of your life are? Who through faith, so everything they accomplished. The Bible commends those. And the good news to you and I this morning is this. The same faith that changed them is the faith that's been passed down to us. The same faith that gave them the ability to accomplish is the faith that has been passed down to us. Look at verse 34. They quenched the fury of flames. They escaped the edge of the sword. Now look at this. Whose weaknesses were turned into strength. See, you have a tendency to look at what you lack. See, faith overcomes inadequacy. When you begin to trust in the living God, see, you are just looking at the wrong thing. If you're looking at your bank account, if you're looking at your test scores, if you're looking at your status in life, you are looking at the wrong thing. You need to lift up your eyes because let me tell you this, it doesn't matter what people say, it's what do you believe about the God that you serve because their weakness was turned into strength and became powerful in battle and routed foreign armies. And so listen, If you're taking notes this morning, listen. Faith is strengthened through, number one, looking back. Looking back. 
one of the characters that I didn't tell you about, but one that we're most familiar with, the story of David. But let me tell you this. You and I would have never known who David was without a defining moment in David's life. And guess when it came? It came when he was a teenager. See, you may look at your situation and say, who am I? What am I? Where am I in this life? And what can I do? David, the Bible teaches us that David, when he was growing up, his family overlooked him. His family, his family was prominent in a small village in Israel, the, the village of Bethlehem, okay? His father was Jesse, who was the grandson of, of, of Boaz. Boaz married Ruth, and his dad was Obed, okay? So he was the, the leading elder in this small community. So he was a man of prominence, which is why when the prophet Samuel would come to his house, that it wouldn't arouse the suspicion of the king, because you would go to the most honorable man in the village and have a feast with him. And Samuel had gone there to anoint a king, and guess what? All of the family, now this you have to recognize in the culture of the time. In fact, we glorify the idea of being a shepherd, but in the biblical time, being a shepherd was a duty given to servants, not sons. David was overlooked. David wasn't even invited by the family into a significant event. He wasn't even brought to the table. He was an heir of Jesse, but yet he was out in the fields until the prophet said, don't you have any more boys? He said, well, the youngest. And David comes in. So David was overlooked. David's a teenager. And then one day, Jesse says, David, come over here. He pulls out a wad of cash. He said, I want you to go down to Mick Solomon's. I want you to get some lamb burgers. I want you to get some raisin bread. I want you to get some goat milk shakes because your brothers are in the army with, 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 with Saul and they're up on the battle lines with the Philistines. I want you to go bring them these supplies and bring me back word of how the battle is going because guess what? They didn't have Instagram. They didn't have Facebook. Nobody, uh, they had a, they had a, actually you had to get your face to face with someone else to get your news, okay? So he sends David. So David arrives with his supplies. And what's going on? What he walks in the middle of is something that had been going on day after day. Because in that day, the, 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 the armies were aligned and there was a valley between them. We were both on a ridge. You see, the Philistines secretly feared the God of Israel. And they were afraid of Saul because when the Spirit of the Lord would come upon Saul, Saul was capable of doing mighty things. So the Philistines figure, we've got a secret weapon. Now, everybody knows the story of David because who did David fight? Goliath, right? You wouldn't even know who Goliath was if it wasn't for David. But Goliath was an 11-foot man, trained from his youth in the ways of warfare. And so he'd come out every day into the valley, and he would badmouth the Israelites he would say, come on, you cowards, send out your top fighter. They were looking for Saul to come out. Because Saul was head and shoulders above everybody else in Israel. Okay? Come on, send them out. Let's have a fight. And whoever wins will serve the other. And so he's sitting there, and then he goes to not just badmouthing the army of God. He, defy, he defies the God of Israel. Well, David's there with the supplies. All of a sudden, he drops the lamb burgers. He's like, what did I just hear? And the question is this, what comes over a 17-year-old to make them act in the manner in which he's about to act? Because we get a glimpse of it. Because what is it that comes out of David's mouth? Because all of a sudden he hears this man defying the armies of the living God, and he said, who is this uncircumcised Philistine? In other words, I don't care how big he is. He doesn't have a covenant with almighty God. If none of you are willing to go, let me go. I'll go to war against him. So David, you see, David, his heart broke for what broke the heart of God. David, here's the point, guys. Until you get to the place that I live for the glory of God. 
David said, you know what? I can't sit by and allow this individual to defy the armies of God. And here's my point, friends. You see, we look around, we look at our supplies, we look at the situation, we look at our times, we, we can get distressed. And too many Christians, part of this message is because too many Christians, I find, hiding and waiting for Jesus to show up. But I want you to know the commander of our faith will not sit by and allow, because the question we have to ask is this, whose army are we? Is it based on our strength? Is it based on our ability? Is it based on our resources? Or is it based on the living God? God, he said, we are the army of God. We are the army of God. And so he was willing because his heart broke because guess what? I can't sit by and allow this to go on that would bring dishonor to the God that I love and serve. Why do we sit by when there is giants in our world? We look at homelessness. We look at racism. We look at drug addiction. We look at all of these problems. And where do we look? Unfortunately, too many in the church world. You look to the government. You look to someone else. And God's saying, Who are, whose army are you? You and I, we have a responsibility because the things that are going on in our time. And too many, you guys, I can't sit by and allow Connecticut to be one of the least dis reached states in the union. You and I have to have a heart that breaks for what breaks the heart of God. You and I have to say, listen, it doesn't matter what we have. It doesn't matter who we are. It doesn't matter. It, it, it all is defined in who do we believe in. Whose army are we? And so David, he goes out against Goliath. Goliath eyes David up and down. And he said, what am I, a dog that you throw me a stick? And David, you hear, see his faith is what defied him. What, what defined him. This was a defining moment in his life because nobody believed it was possible. You see, too often you allow, why is it for so often that on fire Christians are talked out of their faith by non-on fire Christians? Why are lukewarm, lazy believers in our day who are unwilling to get involved that, that, that bring this area of saying, who are we? No, whose army are we? Why can we sit back and allow all to go on around us when the God that we serve isn't changed? Is he big enough to handle the challenges of our times? It's our faith that needs to define us. It's our belief and our willingness because see, with God, he needs someone like David that says, it doesn't matter. I don't count my life worthy of anything. I am yours unwillingly. I live for the glory of God. I live for what I can do to say, God, here's my life, use me. And David looked at that man, how if it's not faith, in the God of Israel. If you hadn't looked back and recognized who was Abraham, who was Isaac, who was Jacob, who was Moses, who was all that had gone before us, now the baton is hitting my hand. And now he can look at Goliath and say, you come against me with sword and spear. But I tell you, I come against you in the name of the Lord of hosts. And let me tell you what's going down today. I'm not only gonna kill you, I'm gonna cut off your head and then I'm gonna give all of the Philistine army as food for the birds. Yeah, that's what I'm telling you is going to happen. And guess what happened? Exactly what David said. You and I must look beyond the pale of what's happening in our times and recognize that the same God who showed up in that valley is the same God that will show up when we have a faith that says, God, use my life. I'm not my own. You see, and what gave David the confidence? You sit there today. When, he, when the king said to him, well, who are you? He said, listen, I was watching my dad's sheep. A lion and a bear came along. You see, you look at it today. You may be looking at it and going, man, my marriage is in trouble. I could face in the mountain of death. 
You need to kill some lions and bears because the same God, you see, before God launches you out on that main platform, you need to recognize that no matter what your challenges are, God is able to give you victory in every single area of your life. You need to trust him. You need to give yourself unashamedly, unconditionally to say whatever you say, Lord. Here am I. Secondly, Faith is strengthened, listen, through resistance. Through resistance. See, faith is strengthened by looking back, but faith is strengthened through resistance. It's easy to believe God when everything's going good. It's easy to believe God when your bills are paid and your kids ain't acting up and your marriage is good. It's easy to come to church and lift your hands and praise God. No, true faith is when things are not going your way, that you trust God despite your circumstances, that you are unchanged, that you will not give in, give up, turn tail and run. No, God is bigger. And guess what? Great victories come out of great battles. If David hadn't gone against Goliath, you wouldn't have known who he is. We all want the victory. The question is, are you willing to engage? Are you willing to get involved? Are you willing to trust God even when you don't see what the outcome is naturally speaking? You see, faith is like a spiritual muscle. And how do you build muscle? Well, simple. It's what you eat and what you do. And too many of you be neat, 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 and you wonder why there's no strength. Because you need to do something with your faith. You need to believe God. You need to step out. You need to stay active. You need to say yes, because guess what? Strength, isn't it true? Anybody, if you lift the weights, what? It's based on resistance. The more weight that's put on you, the more you're able to push off. See, when you recognize who's your enemy, your enemy is not your culture. Your enemy, your enemy doesn't come in red pajamas with a pitchfork. Your enemy is Satan that tells you you can't. But you and I must believe in God because guess what? It's easy to love when people are nice. But being committed to loving when people are not lovely back, when it comes to loving your enemies, to being who God has called us to be in this generation, you see, faith grows the more resistance we get into the more we push off and say no I won't go the way of the world I won't give in to hate I won't allow the situations that are going on around me to pull me in and become politicized become partisan become separate no I'm going to stay in the radical middle I'm going to love I'm going to recognize the reason I'm here is to connect people to God because the only thing that will change the human heart is, a, is a, an encounter with the living God is faith in Jesus Christ and we have blunted the sword we have allowed ourselves to get pulled in to different sides and no we must be con committed to stay where God has placed us that we are agents of God that we represent the living God and it's through resistance that we become stronger it's through resistance that we say, no, we're not going to let the devil pull us in to all the other stuff. I'm not going to let my emotions rule. I'm going to love. I'm going to care. I'm going to get involved. I'm not looking whether it's easy. No, I'm going to dive into the midst of it. I'm going to get involved. I'm going to see what's hurting and say, you know what? It's not somebody else's problem. No, how can I walk by this day by day and not make a difference? No, faith says, no, God, while I'm here, you can count on me. I'm going to get involved. It becomes stronger through resistance. And lastly, lastly, faith is strengthened. Listen to me. Faith is strengthened by believing God is in control. Believing God is in control. Go back to Hebrews 11 for a moment. Look at verse 35. See, women received back their dead, raised to life again. There were others who were tortured, refusing to be released, so they might gain an even better resurrection. See, to all these Hebrews, they recognize that the people that they grew up idolizing, they were the heroes that they looked at. When you looked at their lives, none of the people of Israel believed that they had exchanged something good for something bad. No, they all commended them. They all believed in them. Even though, whether it's Jeremiah, who was imprisoned and tormented by his own people, 
that all of these heroes of faith, things weren't always bright, things weren't always good, but they believed God because they said this, my life is not my own. God, whatever you want to do with it, because listen to me, history is his story. What part are you willing to give God, listen to me, unconditionally? The generation we live in, we look, well, does it have a benefit for me? I don't know if I'll commit to that till I can see how it will better my life. God says, listen, you live for me, you will never regret what I do through you. Will it be easy? No, that's why you need to be tough as nails. You need to recognize because why? There were others that were tortured, refusing to be released so that I might gain an even better resurrection. See, when we live for our faith, we recognize there's a heaven to gain. And you know what? The hardships and the difficulties of the people around us, maybe they need to see us believe so much that when we're not moved by what goes around, that they'll be willing to trust in the God that we trust in. If we want them to trust in God Almighty, but we're unwilling to trust, then we limit the message that we, that we say we have the answer for the world. The question is, do we believe it? Does our life represent it? Are we willing to love and forgive when no one else is willing to? Are we willing to get involved and give of our resources, our time, and our efforts when nobody else does? Do we think that giving anything to God requires something that we hold some leverage on God that God owes me? Are you kidding me? The very faith that we've been given came because the Son of God came to earth and became human and gave everything because everything we've inherited is because Jesus was willing to give it all. How can we be followers of him if we don't believe God is in control? That my life, its meaning, takes on that importance when I'm willing to be a better sacrifice. Refusing to be released, that they might gain an even better resurrection. Verse 36, some fish jeers and flogging. And you think just because somebody gave you a dirty look at work, you're willing to wilt? You know, do we have snowflake Christianity? <laughs> or are we tough as nails? And even chains and imprisonment, verse 37. They were put to death they were by stoning. They were sawed in two. They were killed by the sword. They went about in sheepskins and goatskins, destitute, persecuted, and afflicted. You know, before you have the temptation, I think it's all back. Let me tell you this. Maybe you don't recognize that the very reason you have the ability to read the Bible in the English language is because God raised up a man named William Tinsdale. William Tyndale was a, was a scholar. He was in school in Oxford. And he became in, impregnated by God with a vision to make the Bible understandable by the common man. And so he went to the Bishop of London, Bishop Woosley, and said, will you grant me permission to translate the Bible into English from the Greek scriptures. And at that time, it was illegal. The church had said, no, that's not possible. And he petitioned multiple times. They said, no, 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 no. And so what did he do? He left England. He went into Germany, where now under Lutherism, there was a freedom that he found. And so in Wittenberg and in Worms, he translated the first Bible, the first translation in the English language, and then smuggled them into England. He became enemy one in England. King Henry VIII, Thomas More, and others said that he is a heretic. He must die. Now, they actually helped his work by buying up all his manuscripts and paid for his works. But then in Belgium, years later, a friend of his betrayed him, turned him over to the, to, to the, to the English people and to the English authorities, I should say. And what happened? They put him on trial they found him guilty of being a heretic. They executed him in 1536 for what was his charge? Translating the Bible into the English language. And so he was strangled to death and burned at the stake. But I use this picture because it is famous. You know, William Wallace had nothing over on William Tinsdale because when they were gonna kill him, he, he yelled at the top of his lungs from, the, from that stake and said, Lord, Open the eyes of the king of England. 
Do you know that with one, within 100 years, when the authorized King James Bible was given by the, by the British government to, to translate. It was William Tinsdale's work that, 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 that outfitted that opportunity. You see, we wouldn't have it without those. You see, it's William Tinsdale. It's people like that that have handed the baton from generation to generation. And now, let me tell you a contemporary one. 1959, a young preacher named David Wilkerson, a skinny preacher from a, from a little country town in Pennsylvania. All of a sudden, one night, cover of Life magazine sees two teenagers that are on trial for murder. And God breaks his heart. His heart breaks for what breaks the heart of God, for the gang culture in New York City. Here he is in a country area of Pennsylvania. Who is he? But God. He said, God. And he goes to New York City and begins to preach the gospel in the streets of New York. One of the most infamous Gangs at that time were the Mau Maus, okay? Nikki Cruz and others were a part of it. And David Wilkerson, without any regard for his own life, said, God, use my life. And Nikki Cruz threatened him and said, Preacher, I'm going to cut you up in a thousand pieces. And David Wilkerson said, Then every one of those pieces, Nikki will say, I love you and Jesus loves you. And then, preaching in St. Andrew's Chapel in an open-air crusade. It was the members of the Mau Mau gang that gave their hearts to Christ and exchanged their weapons for Bibles. Imagine today, Nicky Cruz wouldn't be preaching the gospel in the ways that he did and all the others without David Wilkerson. And then David Wilkerson recognizes that to this youth culture, the thing that's controlling them and, 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 and destroying their lives is the drug epidemic in New York City. So what does he do? Stand back and wait for the government to bring a solution? To stand and wait for someone else to do something about it? No. What does he do? He raises up Teen Challenge. It is a faith-based solution to the drawback epidemic. You see, until you and I, till our hearts break for what breaks the heart of God, till our faith grabs us to the point that says, not under my watch, there's homelessness, there is human trafficking, there are problems around us that, that defy our understanding. But guess what? They are nothing compared to the God we serve. Our eyes have been on the wrong thing. God says, get your eyes on me. And how many people? I could, get, I could raise up people all across this auditorium. Per time. Some of them came up to me in first service who Teen Challenge changed their lives. And then, later in his life, you think he's accomplished enough? Just one man. Walking. I grew up in Stanford, Connecticut, okay? I used to go into the city as a kid. You go down today to Times Square and 42nd Street, trust me, it's nothing like it was when I was a kid. It was the cesspool of the New York culture. It was filled with crime and, and sex and all sorts of, you know, illegitimate stuff going on. And David Wilkerson walking through Times Square praying and he cries out and he cries to God and says, God, 1986, God, do something about this. And you know what God does? God screams right back at him and says, no, you do something about this. <laughs> See, we're crying out, God, do something. But are you listening? Because the God of heaven needs a vessel that he can work through. He needs someone that will believe him, someone that will trust in him. And God said to him, no, you do something. Plant a church. And right there, and you see, no secular person will give credit to the transformation of Times Square. People from the secular community, they look at Disney and businesses and other things. But let me tell you the truth. It's a spiritual warfare that we're engaged in. And it was, I believe, the planting of Times Square Church that changed the radius of that area because we unleashed a dynamic power from heaven that was transformational. So if one man could make that difference. You see, I want you to look back right now and feel the baton handed to this generation. I want you to understand what are you doing with your faith? 
What excuse do we have not to give God our all if those that have gone before us, that have given us what we so often take for granted, how can we live with ourselves? How can we answer the God of heaven if we don't give everything to see God's glory manifested in this generation? So let me close it with this. Four questions. I put these in your notes. So you can ask these, not just today, but over this next week. And that's number one is this, will our faith, and who Jesus is and what he has done for us. Free us to love others boldly. See, why do you sit and think that it's somebody else's responsibility to encourage someone, to love someone, to comfort someone, to believe with someone, to give some of your time, your talent, your treasure to get involved? Why is it someone else's responsibility? When is faith gonna grip our hearts and change us from the inside out? When are we gonna say, no, God, here am I. Here am I, because faith overcomes inadequacy. Will we, will we? Number two, will we love our enemies? Stand against injustice, show compassion in our world, and make the good news of Jesus known in our generation. Because guys, God is counting on us. You're tempted to think right now today, Pastor Ken's had too much espresso. It's just something that's going through right now. He'll get it out of his system. But no, what I want you to recognize right now, God is talking to us. He's trying to write on the tables of our hearts. Who will trust me in this generation? Who will give themselves un, un, unabashedly, unashamedly, un, uncompromisingly? And say, God, here am I. Will we love our enemies, stand against injustice, show compassion in our world, and make the good news of Jesus? Because why? Guys, listen to me. Everybody lives forever somewhere. If it doesn't break your heart that the people who sit in darkness right now, that don't know the good news you take for granted, if it doesn't bother you, if it doesn't break your heart, we need to spend more time with the God of heaven who gave his one and only son to make it possible that every human being might hear the good news of Jesus, that we would love enough to go out, to step out of our comfort zones and share our faith unashamedly from love, from love. Number three, will we allow Jesus to change our world through us? Will we allow Jesus because you don't know what God can do through you. He can do exceedingly abundantly above all you can think or even ask. You see, one life given to God holy, no way would David Wilkerson ever imagine in 1959 what God would do through his life. And you have no idea what God can do through your life. Why do you sit there today and talk yourself out of it? Why do you sit there today and say, he's not really talking to me? Why do you sit there today and say, oh, man, I'm not sure I'm glad I came today, but man, no, why? Are we not moved enough to say, God, surrender. Whatever you want to do, do through me. Will we allow Jesus to change our world through us? And lastly, what will history record about the faith of this generation? It's still being written. I just want you to look back and recognize that all of those that we've so easily say, well, they were different. Their times were different. No. They face challenges like we face challenges. They face giants like we face giants. They face turbulence and difficulty and pressure and pushback and people that don't want to hear just like we do. But if they could turn their weaknesses into strength, if they can be made mighty, how much more? can God do in you and I? What are we living for? What are we doing with our faith? What are we willing to allow God to do through us?